What's the next level? Once you accept the fact that you just got to keep fighting, and you're constantly fighting yourself, like Paul explains in Romans 7, it's constantly up, down, up, down, zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. First I'm thinking toward you and I'm thinking the right thought and I understand the doctrine. Then the next thing I know I'm getting all ticked off at windows. That's basically how my day goes. And I forget all about God and I think about how mad I am that some idiot designed windows the way he did. And then I use 1 John 1 9 I'm back online with God and then five minutes go by and I get mad at windows again because I have to basically live on the computer. Once you accept that that's the way it has to go and you keep on, you get into sort of like a routine of living like that. Zigzag all day long. And then you're "Ah, so glad you get to go to sleep at night. Once you've actually accepted that, then other things start happening. You start to get real big-minded. Your scope of perception and ability to understand like the world picture and the sweep of history and the sweep of the Bible and all that will enlarge. And as it does, you start finding yourself asking the question, God, why do you want to live like this? Because you start to realize that this very zigzag pattern you're going through is what God goes through. He likes it. In other words, in our case, the zigzag is we find we're tempted, whereas God isn't. We're tempted, and the only way we can, you know, deal with it is to either sin and use 1 John 1 9, or we fight the temptation with some Bible concepts, verses, principles, whatever. But it's a constant fight. Okay? A constant fight. In comes this idea, and it's against God, and you either cave in and then use 1 John 1 9 and fight, or you fight it with some Bible principle. So it's, it's like, you know, thrust and parry, thrust and parry, thrust and parry all day long in your head. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. Okay? In God... It's still thrust and parry, but it's not like he's tempted. It's more like tennis, where the ball is thrown at you and you hit a good hit in reply. And you have to admit that that's pretty satisfying. I'm not really a tennis person, I'm more racquetball, but it's the same idea. Someone hits the ball and you manage to hit a really good, you know, hit in reply. And he might even make a point. Of course, with God, he's always making the point. He loves that fight. He loves that play. He loves the bad thing coming in. And then he's got this terrifically gorgeous reply to it that he unites with the bad thing coming in. That's why the bad thing gets to exist. He wants truth be free. He wants full spectrum. He'll accept anything, anytime, anywhere, just for what it is, just because, because truth. Truth be bad, truth be good, but it's still truth. Okay, but at the same time, there's a juridical, how do you want to call it, um, fiat that has to be levied. Yes, this bad thing should be allowed to exist because it's free. Okay, but at the same time, it's not fair to God that this bad thing exists unless something good is made on it. Well, the only person who can do that, because remember, good has to be perfect, is God has an answer to every bad thing that exists. Do you have some earwax in your ear? Okay, God has to see that earwax. He has to see you mess with it. So then, what's the juridical justification for it being there? Well, he's got an answer to it that he's baptized onto it since eternity passed. So before the earwax existed, his answer existed to it. 
So he's had all that enjoyment of his answer to the earwax before it existed, during its existence, and after it's gone. That's how he looks at it. He loves the reply that he baptized onto the earwax in your ear that will be there until you pick it out and get all frustrated about it. And he's got to reply to your frustration. And he's got to reply to everything that ever happens to anybody, whether they believe in him or not, whether they grow up in him or not. He has baptized every single thing. And all the justification for doing that came on the cross when Christ paid for all sins because everything is, is a direct or an indirect consequence of sin. The price of doing business. Now sooner or later you're going to wake up to that. The zigzag of Romans 7 is exactly how God likes it to play. He likes answering. When those sins javelin pierced Christ, Christ enjoyed the answer in his head. He enjoyed it. The justice of whatever the value of the answer in his head was so gorgeous to the Father and to him and to the Spirit. Because remember, the cross is never dead to them. It's still happening. Every moment in time is a forever moment to them. They love that joining moment when his thought joined that sin coming into him. They love it. So this back and forth zigzag of Romans 7 is how life is experienced by God. Only it's all happening at once. The moment that God decreed creation to begin is still happening. Ten billion years from now, wherever we all are at that point, is still happening. And there's a zigzag of billions and billions and billions of thoughts and people and movements that are all happening at once. And he's experiencing the whole thing at once, at the same time, right now, as 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years from now, 2 billion years ago, 2 billion years from now. And that's your life too. Now, at this point, if you weren't ready to give up on the spiritual life before, you're going to sure want to give up on it now. But how come you don't? 2 Corinthians 5 14? Love for Christ, soon echo, holds us together. It's translated compels in the NASB. And similarly translated in the KJV. The idea that it, it f kind of forces you. Soon echo doesn't mean that, it means to hold together. Soon means together, echo means to grasp, to have, to hold. The love for Christ holds you together. It's translated love of Christ, but it's it's subjective and objective genitive. Go go to be Greek or something to find out what that means. I've explained it before. It's love for Christ holds us together. That's the only way you can go on. So by the time you figure out that the zigzag is God's own lifestyle. And hi, if you want to become like Christ, that's what awaits you. The only thing that's going to make you grow past that without quitting is that you just love him, that's all you know. And that, this is where I'm at with it, to be honest. I find every day, I, I go to God, I say, how can you live like this? And I always end up by saying, you're God, I'm not, that's all I know. I... I've known God my whole life. I don't even understand what it's like not to believe in Him. But that doesn't mean I don't reject it. It doesn't mean I don't disobey Him all the time. I'm disobeying Him from knowledge. When I was spiritually a baby, I disobeyed Him from ignorance. So you see, you got one kind of spiritual battle when you're a baby. And if you make it into a spiritual adulthood, it'll take about 20 years. 
and I mean 20 years of actual study, you know, seven, eight hours a week, not once on Sunday, rah, rah, Jesus. About 20 years of seven hours a week study, and that includes the original languages. Then you start to become a spiritual adult, roughly. For some people it takes longer because they actually don't learn. And other people, you know, they don't necessarily have to take a full 20 years before they get there. It really depends on how much you learn per class. But you do need that much class, and you need to learn in every class. That's why I'm saying 20 years. At that point, you start to go through this thing I'm describing. And it's a kind of inchoate at first. You're vaguely dissatisfied. But it's like it's a choice between God, you know, between, you know, rejecting God altogether and um, slogging it through. Paul chose to slog it through. Ephesians 3.14 Kata, skopon, dioko, ais, to, braveo, teis, ano, klesios, tu, teu, and Christo, Jesu. You feel the plotting cadence of that? That's Ephesians 3.14 in Greek. In my American accent in Greek. That's what it becomes. It becomes a plotting. Because this whole zigzag that Paul's talking about in Romans 7 becomes your life. And it doesn't matter how nice things are, and they will be. It doesn't matter how much money you have, and you will have it. It doesn't matter how much God takes away, and he will take away. He's going to take you full circle. You're supposed to have all the highs and have all the lows. Like Paul said, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. It's a round robin. But this is what it's about. It's a lifestyle of constant fighting, pressure. Something hits you, you have to reply. Something hits, you have to reply. It hits, you reply. It hits, you reply. Now, maybe guys like that. I don't. Constant fighting in the soul. Fighting if you're parrying the temptation. I, I don't see the enjoyment of it. But God enjoys it. That I know. And I'm, I'm constantly just amazed that he does. I don't understand. I mean, I can explain it. But for all that, I don't understand it. How do you enjoy a process like this? How can you want to be alive? If this is what being alive means. Now, when I say I don't understand it, and it bothers me, I am echoing exactly what Satan's saying. This is where he tripped up. You can see that in Matthew 4 and Job 1, Job 2. He finally concluded that something's got to be wrong with God. That he would want to live like this. That's basically what he's saying to Christ in Matthew 4. Why don't you turn all the stones into bread? You can. Why make it hard on yourself? Okay, and he's saying the same thing it, it, with a little variation. The second temptation, jump off the temple. He's saying, you know, why are you making it hard on everybody else to believe in you? Just do a miracle so they know. See, Satan thinks he's a messiah himself. That's, he's really convinced that God's screwball. Okay, and of course the third temptation was just brute ins insult. Bow to me and, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Because the first two temptations didn't work. And he was so shocked he reverses potis a protesis and a potesis. So that's why in, in English you can't see that. He said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you'll bow down. Okay, he was so shocked that Christ didn't respond that that he reverses what he says. But it's, it's an insult because Christ was already ruler of everything. And see, he's really upset that God makes it hard on himself. And then he makes it hard on us when he could just snap his fingers and everything would work. And as you get to your own Romans 7 in the spiritual life. When you get past, 
You know, the do I love God question, am I sure God's alive? What does this Bible really add up to? All those childish things you go through. And you start doing your own fighting. After a while, you start to notice, well, you know, I'm, my life is like Romans 7. And then the next step up from that is, wait a minute, this is how God himself lives. Because of the nature of omniscience. That's when you, like Satan, and like me, are going to be faced with this question. How can you stand it, Dad? How can you stand living like this? And the only thing that will get you through that is that Second Corinthians 5.14, the love for Christ holds us together. Ephesians 3, um, 15 through 19. Come to know the love for Christ. Because in the in the dark patches, this is a definite dark patch that you will be constantly living with all the time for the rest of your life. In the dark patch, the only thing that 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 you can answer it with is if this is how you want to live, then I want to live that way too. It's no longer about being a good girl or a bad girl, or a good boy or a bad boy. It's not about morality. It's not about how high he is versus how low you are. All those issues are completely wiped out at this phase. It's just strictly the intimacy of knowing how it is for God to live versus yourself. And do you make the same choice?